Tá. So uh, let's then uh, restart. Uh, uh, the second talk of this morning session is by Professor Victor Caroso from the physics department at the Catholic University in Rio. And he's going to talk about the synthesis and defects in two-dimensional materials. Thank you. Good morning. Um, first, thank you for organizing for this invitation. So. I will talk today a little bit about synthesis in, in general and how to synthesis can help you to get sample that you need. And a little bit about the effects in these systems uh, in focus on two-dimensional two materials team and team this. Okay, um, I split this presentation in basic uh, two parts. Uh, the first part uh, I will focus on the synthesis of monolayer and other structures of uh, TMDs, um, different ways to get single crystals or polycrystals or even films. Uh, in the second part of uh, this talk, I will, um, I will discuss a little bit optical characterization of the effects, starting uh, a little bit about Rama, and after that, I will go a little bit deep um, in photoluminescence in this. Uh, two-dimensional uh, systems. So first step is um, how to synthesize um, monolayers, single crystals of moly uh, and tungsten disulfide. You, uh, we usually use this technique here that we call atmosphere pressure CVD, APCVD. This is a quite simple technique. Uh, uh, we need a furnace. Here are tubular furnace. This furnace should reach the temperature around 800 and 800 to 700 degrees Celsius. And here, um, the left side, uh, you can use another furnace or one simple heating belt, um, because the temperature here is just um, is just 300 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. So uh, at the same to have this. Uh, quartz tube here, and inside this tube, uh, you put here this left side of this, in this heating belt, use, uh, you put the calcogenite, that, that could be sulfur, uh, selenium, tellurium. Uh, in the middle of this furnace, uh, we put the precursors. Uh, if you want to grow molydisulfide, uh, the precursor is the molyoxide, and if you want to grow uh, the tungsten disulfide, the precursor should be the tungsten oxide. So, okay, um, if you mix the precursor, of course, you can get different TMDs. Here, two same images, uh, and a little bit the morphology about these two um, different materials. Okay, for the synthesis of selenide, uh, you should use uh, a different flow. Uh, here it's for, for moly and, and tungsten, and usually you just need the argon. You put you pass argon here inside the tube to carry the uh, the particles here, the calcogenate particles, and um, pa and these particles go to the center of this furnace. And the reaction happening exactly in the middle of this furnace. Um, this uh, for let's see, okay. Okay, let's go. Um, so for sulfur, um, moly disulfide, tungsten disulfide, you just need argon. Here is the flow of this argon, 200 at CCM. But if you want to grow selenides, like moly selenides, tungsten selenide, you should change the, f the, um, the gas. You should use argon plus hydrogen for selenides and tellurides. But this si system is quite simple. And at the end, you have you can get these uh, monolayers uh, of TMDs. So uh, for a simple characterization, uh, characterization identify if you have monolayers or bilayers in these systems, uh, you can use a set of techniques. Here are some examples. Here you want optical, uh, optical image of these samples. Here it's molydisulfide. 
you can use like a contrast between the your sample and the substrate. You can uh, you can do some image processing, calculated contrast, uh, and of course you can use AFM uh, to measure the step. You no, know? and usually for monolayers you have uh, the step size should be around one nanometer or less. Uh, we can also do photoluminescence spectroscopy uh, to identify uh, the monolayer um, samples. No? And we know that um, when you have monolayers, the, um, the band structure of these samples change in related to the book. And uh, when you have just monolayer, the signal for PL is very strong. And the position of this peak is around 1.85. This, uh, you with this, you can identify your monolayers. They just use uh, photoluminescence. Okay, we can also use another uh, optical spectroscope technique. Here is Rama. With Rama, you can check these two peaks here. And for example, if you have monolayer, bilayer, trilayer, and you measure the distance between the position of these two peaks here, you can identify if you have mono two or three layers in your systems. Uh, usually for monolayer in CVD samples, the distance between these two peaks here is around 20 centimeters. It's a little bit different if you check exfoliated samples. In exfoliated samples, the distance is oh, between these two peaks around 18, but this could happen because some strain uh, in, in these systems, in, in the cities of this, uh, these monolayers. Okay, now uh, I want to talk um, a little bit about a different type of synthesis. Uh, here uh, I want to show how you change some parameters of the synthesis. You can get different type of samples, different type of crystalline samples. Here is one example of a synthesis of a monolayer molydiselenide. If you use the, uh, the ratio between these two precursors, the moly and selenium precursors, and if you use one to 200 um, ratio between these two, you can get uh, very big and beautiful triangles here of, uh, of molydiselenide, and probably its triangles are uh, single crystals. No? But if you change a little bit the ratio between moly and selenium, uh, here we decrease uh, to one to 100, you can get samples like this type of samples. They, uh, this not, it's not very clear here, but they are hexagonal. The shape is different. And if you look careful in AFM, you can get some this kind of shape here. It's hexagonal. But if you look at careful uh, around the edge, you can see uh, a lot of needles. No? For us, that means that here, in this case, we have a polycrystalline island. Okay. Uh, just control um, the ratio between these, these two precursors. You can go to very single one single crystal to polycrystal. Okay, um, and here in these systems, it's uh, for us it's a more polycrystal, and you probably have a lot of grain boundaries around this sample here uh, around this island. You want interest uh, type of grain boundaries? It's uh, twin. Green boundaries, and here one diagram of showing a lot of these twin green boundaries, how this look like, and why you want to study this type of samples, why you want to study the uh, polycrystalline samples instead of single crystals, uh, because recently in this report here, um, the authors studied um, this kind of twin green boundaries in molybdenum samples, and they and they found something very interesting. Uh, when they uh, changed the, the temperature of the systems, here it's STM images, scanning tunnel microscopy images. When, you, uh, on the, uh, when they go to room temperature to low temperature and check around these grain boundaries, uh, they saw a uh, charge density wave around these grain boundaries. Okay, this is another STM images. This line here is exactly around the green boundaries. Okay, uh, and this happened, uh, the temperature the of this happens around 190 Kelvin. He wants uh, measurement of resistivity against temperature. 
and they can see these kicks. These kicks correspond the, the transition between uh, four uh, charge density wave uh, states here. And this is happening just in the green boundaries and not in the whole samples. If you, if you have just single crystals, small dice and lines, this will not happen. Okay? So, and while I was thinking what happened with Rama, if you take Rama in these polycrystals uh, at a low temperature, what we did here, we, we did uh, Rama spectroscopy in two different samples. The first one, it's a um, it's a perfect single, it's not perfect single crystal, we have some a few green boundaries here, I'm calling here low density of green boundaries in these triangles, and I took Rama at room temperature, here this red line, and at low temperature, 77 key temperature, this, uh, the blue line here. Uh, the shape of the spectra is al it's, uh, almost the same, there is no big change in these two spectra here. Uh, however, when I change the, when I change the sample and I select this, these polycrystalline samples, here I may also call this sample the snowflakes, that it's almost uh, this flakes of snow, no? When I change the sample and I measure the Rama at room temperature, this is the red line here, this Rama at room temperature, and I took Rama spectra at low temperature, 770 key, I saw this enhancement of some peaks in the room spectra. So uh, this, this study, it's, uh, it's ongoing study, uh, but we are thinking that these peaks, that the enhancement of these peaks could be related to charge density wave. Okay, right now it's, it's not very clear, but it's an ongoing project, okay? Uh, now, this is another work, um, here is, um, I'm, I'm proposing a new road to decrease the temperature of the synthesis of TMDs, okay? We, we found a way to uh, decrease the temperature goes to seven around uh, 750 degrees to 550 degrees. That could be uh, very interesting for industry application. No? Because the temperature of this normal temperature of the synthesis of, of moly and two standards of fire is quite high. And the idea here is how to decrease this temperature uh, for the synthesis. And the trick uh, was um, I, I'm mixing my oxide, in this case moly oxide, with sodium. Uh, in this case, it's sodium nitride. When I mix these two precursors here, I can decrease a lot the temperature of the synthesis. The setup is almost the same that I showed you before, but the only difference is the uh, I'm mixing these two powders, the precursor molecule oxide and um, the sodium nitride. The sodium uh, probably acts uh, like a catalytic key for this process. That's the reason that I can decrease a lot the temperature. So, um, during the synthesis, we found two main parameters to get good samples and perfect single crystals. One is the ratio between moly and sodium. I another one is the time of the synthesis. So here, we st in the left side, we start with the ratio between one to three, one moly to three sodiums. And what we get, it's uh, this kind of shape. This uh, is not perfect single layer. I the most of the points will have some bulk states, uh, book uh, material uh, here uh, was not too good. And what we did uh, was decrease the amount of sodium. Here it's to three, and it started to going a little bit better. And the best, uh, the best thing that you get uh, when you uh, increase the amount of sodium and uh, compare if, uh, when you increase the amount of molybdenum uh, against sodium, and here is three to one, and here you can get a perfect single crystals. So another uh, parameter that we can check is the time. Um, if you decrease the time, here is 18 minutes to 12, you can get this separate island and perfect single crystals. But of course, it depends on your application. If you want to grow uh, films, it's better if you increase the time. No? 
So uh, to prove that you have uh, perfect single crystals in these systems, uh, here we uh, did some characteriza characterization. Here you have AFM showing the step, it's one nanometer. Here uh, um, Roma, is Roma maps, here's the intensity of E2G and way one g These are perfect. Uh, the distance between these two peaks here is around 20, that we expect. And the photoluminescent is quite high, and the position of these peaks, uh, uh, of the photoluminescent peak is around 1.85. That means we have a perfect single crystals using this cities, uh, using this protocol, no? <laughs> so probably uh, sodium acts like a, a catalytic uh, in this reaction. Okay, no? <laughs> let's uh, change again. This uh, is another type of synthesis. You can do um, CVD and you can grow uh, vertical or in plane heterostructure. Here, one reference of um, tungsten disulfide growth on top of moly disulfide. So, in these systems, uh, the authors uh, just mix the two precursors. Uh, the author just mix the moly oxide and tungsten oxide and heat uh, the temperature around 850 degrees. And what you get, you get this kind of uh, samples. You get, you usually get um, tungsten disulfide on top of moly disulfide. Uh, you can do uh, a different method. You can use um, tellurium in this cities and it mix you these two precursors. And if you decrease a little bit this, uh, the temperature of the synthesis, where what you get is uh, that we call in-plane ether structure. These are completely monolayer, but here is a little bit different. The triangle, it's you have one triangle inside and another triangle outside. The inside triangle here is moly disulfide, and the outside triangle here is tungsten disulfide. E this sample is completely monolayer, okay? You can observe uh, the interface. It's almost atom atomic thin. So using this protocol to grow, uh, to grow vertical ether uh, structures, uh, we, did we follow the same uh, protocol, and you get the same type of samples. Here was this two experiment I was doing in my laboratory. Uh, here we try to grow tungsten disulfide on top of moly disulfide. This synthesis wo works very well. But what we found uh, was uh, sometimes the mismatch between the second layer and the first layer change. You could grow uh, tungsten disulfide on top of moly with the same orientation, like a zero angle of mismatch between these two triangles, or sometimes happen that, happen that this second layer grows in 60 degrees of orientation, like 60 degrees rotate. Okay. This uh, helps uh, uh, happen a, a lot. We usually have this type of uh, synthesis. And what we did was, uh, for was to check the second harmonic generation in these samples. So uh, here, uh, the second harmonic generation signal, uh, red one was took from the moly disulfide single layer. And we know that if you have just monolayer for moly disulfide, you have a non central symmetric matrices, and you can get the second harmonic generation. No? But when you check the second layer here, this number two, we saw that the second harmonic generation increased a lot. Here's the signal in black. Uh, it's almost 10 times higher than the single layer. Uh, in this type of sample here, this when you have zero mismatch, of angle of mismatch. However, when you check the, this type of sample here with 60 degrees, there is no second harmonic generation in this sample. So what's going on here? W why you don't have second harmonic generation in this bilayer? No? So the explanation is quite simple. Uh, when you have uh, this just monolayer samples, you have a non central symmetric material, and you have second, second harmonic generation signal. Um, when you have... A when you call here A, 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 e prime stacking, um, this it's all uh, this 
this is the same that monolith, a non centrosymmetric material, you have signal. So what happens is when you have uh, zero mismatch angle, probably you have a, a prime stacking. So that's the reason we, we got the signal from second harmonic generation. And when you have a B stacking, when you're stacking these two materials in this way here, what you got, it's a centrosymmetric material. Uh, and when you have centrosymmetric material, you don't have signal for second harmonic generation. That probably uh, when you have this type of mismatch here, 60 degree, that means you have a, a B stacking. Okay, here's another work. Uh, we can play with this parameter in the cities. You can got different samples here. One, that one example that you can, can get alloys. You can mix the molten tungsten atoms. Uh, here, one, one example, we have one triangle. Uh, the molten disulfide, it's around the center. But when you check the tungsten disulfide, it's around the whole area of my triangle. Just mix some parameters in the synthesis. In the, in the synthesis you can get uh, like this alloy, changing the mole and tungsten atoms around the, the sample. Okay, uh, this, this is another type of synthesis here. Um, it's how to synthesize films of TMDs. Well for some application, it's better if you have a big areas of TMDs. You know, uh, for this. For do um, for grow this kind of samples, you should change the technique. Here, um, the authors are using a low pressure CVD, so they just put one vacuum pump here um, f in the outlet of this quartz tube and decrease the pressure inside the tube. When you decrease the, the pressure, you can grow films. So like this, this is almost it's almost one by one centimeter here at the center of this silicon piece. So that's to show you that if you change some parameters in these cities, you can go to single crystal, polycrystal, films, and also at the structures in plane or out of plane. S so I, I finished this first part. Uh, now in the second part, I talk about the characterization of the effects in these 2G systems. I will uh, start with talking about Rama, and finally I will talk a little bit about photoluminescence. So for, uh, for Rama, uh, for example, in graphene system, it's uh, a quite long paper here. Some collaborators do, uh, did Rama in different uh, graphenes. And here they can uh, induce the effects in a controlled way and check the RAM spectra of the samples. Here in the left side, you can see when, uh, when you increase the amount of uh, the effects that induce your sample, you start to appear two peaks. We call one, uh, this D peak and D line peak. I, if, if you normalize the intensity of this peak against the LD, LED is the distance between two defects. You can saw that there, there is a quite uh, good behavior of this, uh, this intensity and goes to one maximum position. And after some of this point, just the intensity dec decreases. So there is uh, this one way to check defects in graphene using Rama. Uh, we can also, using graphene, you can check the nature of the effects. Here in this another work, um, the auto plot the intense normalized intensity of D band against the normalized intensity of D line band. You can see this uh, this line here, and you can identify the type of the effect in these systems. For example, uh, you can have sp3 uh, defects, vacuums, or boundary. You can uh, differentiate these three types of defects in graphing systems just using Rama. Okay, but uh, what about the TMDs? For defective in TMDs, we have this reference, and it's from Professor Marcos Pimenta. Uh, stud. Uh, in this work, they did uh, it's almost the same the people did uh, in graphene. They took a, a very perfect crystalline MOS2 and induced the effects in a controlled way, and they 
they saw that at some point they start they start to see one peak. This peak uh, it's a LEA in N, and this peak increases intensity when you increase the amount of the effect. Uh, here is the plot of the intensity, normalized intensity of this peak against the LED. So when you uh, decrease the LED or increase the amount of the effect, the intensity of this peak just increase linear. Uh, the behavior is a little bit different, but the message is uh, we, can, we can use the Roma, identify the amount of the effects in your system, um, graphene or TMDs. Okay, this for Roma. Now uh, let's talk a little bit about photoluminescence in these systems. So uh, in the photoluminescence in TMDs monolayer, we have like a family of different axons. So um, I will explain just uh, three of these axons here. Uh, the most prominent uh, peak in the photoluminescence spectra of TMDs, it came from the neutral axon. The, ne the neutral axon, it's, uh, it's a body composed of one electron and one hole of energy a little bit below the, uh, the gap energy of the material and the difference of the energy of the gap energy and the position of this neutral axon uh, we call the by the energy of these axons. So for trions, trions it's made by three particles that could be two, elect uh, two electrons and one hole or two holes and one electron and has energy a little bit below the neutral axons. And the third one is the bound axons. Bound axons is a little bit different. Bound, ax bound axon is a neutral axon trapped by a fixed charge. It's a three-body complex, but the energy is lower than the trial energy. So uh, here one example here, uh, two photoluminescent spectra took from different power, and you can see a lot of peak here. Here is a neutral axon, trions, and different axons. In this system, we have um, quite a family of different axons that came from um, different type of excitation. Uh, in the next step, in the next slides, I will focus on the bound axons because we know that bound axons could be related to the effects. So here we, uh, we studied about uh, the bound axons in two cell disulfide monolayer samples. Here one image of one triangle, and this image was took in 70, 70 K, it's low temperature. So what we, uh, what we did was uh, to take Rama a different point of the samples. Here, uh, this is a photoluminescence spectra in three different points of the samples. Uh, the main peak here, the high peak, it's, uh, the, it's in the neutral axon, and the black, the black curve here came from the inner part of my triangle. You can see it's very flat here around this position, and uh, you have a, a high peak here. Uh, but when I check the edges of the samples here, triangle in orange is another sample here in red, uh, we saw um, a broad peak appear around 50 and 70 and 50 around this region here, very broad and small peak, okay? Here we took the photoluminescence images uh, at low temperature, but selecting different regions of my uh, spectra. Here I use an uh, optical filter to, to select just the neutral axons, and these images in the same region, the same triangle, uh, you can see the signal came from uh, around the, the whole sample, but when I change the filter and select this region here, around seven, uh, 1750, uh, uh, the image, um, you can find the image that the signal just came from around the edge, and very strong here in these uh, bad samples. Here, uh, here's the cross section. Uh, the neutral axon, it's almost homogeneous around the edge, but if you change the filter, it selects just the region of this bound axons, they are concentrated around the edges of the samples. So uh, we think what's going on uh, in these samples, why the signal just came from the edges, not at the center of these um, S-grow samples. 
what we did was checking the samples with using high resolution STM images. So what we did, we we did a lot of um, experiments. Like we took uh, thousands of images. We literally count the type of the effect that we have uh, around the center of the samples in around the edge. For edge, uh, it means one micron of distance uh, from the from start of the edge. Okay, so. We took several images and we measured the different type of defects that you can find in these images. So the most of the most of defects that you can find is sulfur vacuums. So here in yellow, we select um, the po exactly atomic position of these sulfur vacuums. So this sulfur vacuums happen when you just remove one sulfur on top of your TMEDs. Okay. I that we found that around the edge you have we have a lot of more defects, more different type of defects, but we have more sulfur vacuums. So after count like several images, you came out with this histogram here. And the count of mono sulfur vacuums around the edge is like two times higher than the, the number of sulfur vacuums defects near the center. Okay, that's what we found, we found more monosulfur vacuums around the edge in comparison with the center. <laughs> so here are now the experiments to comprove that we have bound axon here. We took uh, several PL, uh, PL spectras for different incident power for the inner part of the triangle and around the edge of this triangle. And when you increase the power for the inner part uh, of this triangle, nothing happened. But when you check the position of um, the bound axon here, um, the intensity uh, increases a little bit. And if you plot the, the intensity of the bound axon against the intensity of neutral axon uh, and use the lower, low, lower power to fit this, uh, this data, you came up with this alpha parameter here. This alpha parameter here, when you have uh, 0.5, that means uh, there is no signature of uh, bound axons. Uh, if, you, if you had triangles, probably this alpha parameter uh, should be 0.5 to 1, or if you have this alpha parameter higher than 1, probably you have B axons. So this is another way to prove that uh, this region here, this peak, came from uh, bound axons. Okay, we also uh, stood the term stability of these bound axons. In this case, here we took several PL um, spectras for different temperatures. So this is a color map. Um, the intensity, uh, the color uh, represents the intensity, the PL intensity, uh, for different temperatures here. Uh, and this line here shows the position of the bound axon. Here it's better to see the spectras uh, that I took from this image. When you decrease uh, the temperature, the bound axon uh, starts to increase, no? And that's the point for this type of measurements. Uh, you need to decrease the temperature to see the bound axon. You cannot see bound axon at room temperature. That's the, the tricky point for, uh, for this study, okay? You cannot, you cannot characterize your samples, uh, just check the bound axon at room temperature, because you need to decrease uh, the temperature to start to see these bound axons. So uh, we adjust the, uh, the intensity of this bound the axon against the temperature, and we came out with this uh, parameter here, this activation energy. Uh, it's 36 milli electron volts. It is the energy to release the neutral axon from the fixed charge. Uh, remember that the bound axon looks like this, uh, three-body complex. Um, and this, this energy that I came out from this adjustment here is this energy to release this neutral axon. It's, it's a quite small. Okay. And usually, if you uh, compare with the position of neutral axon, here in red, the position of neutral axon, the difference between the position of these two uh, peaks, it's the binding energy of the complex. That's uh, it's, uh, 300 milli electron volts. It's just the difference of position of the neutral axon to the position of this bound axon. It's around 300 milli electron volts. And, and finally, to really prove that this band, this band in the PL, came from 
the bound axons. We did some DFT calculation uh, for the bond structure with just uh, monosulfa vacans. And here we what we got, we got the bond structures and this mid gap states here in red. Okay, and the position of this mid gap states here related to this uh, the conduction band here, it's exactly 300 milli electron volts. It's exactly this distance here. The difference between neutral exon and the bound exons. So here, uh, and probably these mid gap states, they are responsible to trap the neutral exon and form my bound exons. Okay. Uh, so I finished that part. Uh, now I will talk uh, a little bit about a uh, different uh, work. Uh, in this work, we we are trying to go to grow uh, molybdenum on top of molybdenum It's a vertical ether structure, but the process was a little bit different from that I show you uh, that I show before. In this case, we first grow the molybdenum Here is indicated with yellow triangle here. And we we remove the samples and we did another synthesis uh, for molybdenum was two step synthesis was in uh, was not in the same time okay and wha what we got at the end was uh, the molybdenum uh, we start to grow around the edge here and on top of these molybdenum samples okay um, but. We found one problem. They not follow uh, only one dire crystalline direction. When you check using high resolution S10 images, uh, it's okay. You have uh, in some parts you have molybdenum single layers around the edge. We can find some molybdenum single layers at the center of this triangle. But at some points, uh, we saw uh, bilayer structures with different orientations here. Uh, two different Mohe patterns, that means we have different orientation on top of these uh, this samples. So what we, we did was examine the samples using photoluminescence spectroscopy. Here in the right side, I took two uh, PL spectra, one for the edge. The edge, uh, it's in this circle uh, dot here. You can see just the position of a exon that came from just molybdenum but when I check the, the bilayer region here, this triangular, we can see two peaks. One corresponds uh, to the neutral axon for molybdenum, and this another one, we still there is the neutral axon of molybdenum. So we did more, uh, more characterization uh, just to show you that you we have molybdenum on top of molybdenum. This is some, A, uh, some Roma maps. Um, here's some RAM spectres and AFM. <laughs> and we did the same uh, what we did in, in Tuxian disulfide experiment. Uh, we compared PL images, here's PL intensity in different temperatures in checking different um, uh, neutral axons. Here we use one filter, I can select just the position of molybdenum axons. And we took two images here, and see room temperature, here it's uh, 770 K, and uh, what we found that the signal that came from molybdenum increase when you decrease the temperature. Here this two cross section in the same sample, with the same position, uh, the, the signal increase uh, almost two times when you decrease the temperature. But what happened? Wha what happened when we change the filter and just selecting now the neutral axon of molybdenum? Here, two images: um, one room temperature, another one low temperature, and the signal for the this neutral axon just decreases. Look, goes to um, when you go to low temperature, the signal decreases. The behavior it's exactly the opposite, you know, and also it's opposite that we uh, expect and. Why this uh, the position of this neutral axon? When you decrease the temperature, decrease. This uh, was not common. Here in details, uh, this is a PL map. Um, the color represents the intensive PL map for different temperatures. Uh, 
the color here for these two peaks, the A peak, A peak is a neutral ex exon of molydisilinide. The B peaks are the uh, exon that came from molydisulfide. And here you can easily see that when you decrease the temperature, the neutral exon from molydisilinide increase, but the neutral exon of molydisulfide decrease. Here it's easy to see in these spectras. Uh, a peak, this A peak increase and the B peak decrease. Uh, but what careful uh, check this uh, PL spectra at low temperature is that here uh, for molydisulfide side, you can see this bound exon for molydisulfide increase. Look here, uh, here I call B, 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 B peak, okay? Uh, for us, that means for in these molydisulfide samples, uh, we have more defects, we have more sulfur vacants, you know? You did the same, you did the same experiments. Um, uh, we have here you have high resolution images, and when you check the, the molydisulfide regions, we saw a lot of uh, sulfur vacants in these systems. Uh, that's... Uh it's quite reasonable that remember uh, in this synthesis it was a little bit different. First, I grow the molydisulfide, then I I put the samples uh, again inside a very hot uh, furnace and try to grow molydisulfide. Probably when you increase the temperature for the second synthesis, I probably I create a lot of defects. You know, it's reasonable to think about this. You know, so uh, that's a that's the message. Uh, for this synthesis, I think for vertical electric structure, it's better if you try to grow at the same type, not in two steps, no. Probably you got a lot of defects. So uh, just the, the last one, the last, uh, last image, it's uh, uh, you have like a family of extonic process in this system. This uh, is photominescence spectra for different powers uh, around the bilayer regions. Uh, and when I check the intensity the of the position of this peak, I can adjust uh, this intensity using the lower power and get this alpha parameter, uh, and I can characterize what type of exon that I have. Uh, for example, here for molydisilinide region, I found trions and B exons, and for here for B peaks for molydisulfide region, I found trions and bound exons. And just adjust these curves, I can, I can tell you about what type of exon that I have in these systems. So that was uh, my message. Uh, um, and the first part, um, I show you that it's possible to grow single layer materials uh, using a uh, CBD technique. Uh, you can grow single layers, you can grow uh, films if you wanna, if you can grow vertical ether structures, or alloys, or even though we can grow um, single crystal or polycrystal samples, just change some parameters in your synthesis, in your setup of for, for your synthesis. Um, in the second part, I use the optical uh, spectroscopy characterization to identify defects uh, in, in TMD systems and focus on these um, bulb exons. So uh, some collaborators about this work that I show you here, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Victor. We have time for questions. <coughs>